Welcome everyone, my name is David Kaplan. I'm a professor at the University of Florida and one of the leaders of the Amazon Dams Network at the University of Florida. Welcome to our third session of the International Workshop on Amazon Dams International Research Network. Our workshop is about hydroelectric dams in the Amazon, governance, adaptive management, and alternatives. So welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidos, bienvenidos. As I said, this is a part of a, a five-part series. Here we are today for panel three on adaptive management. We're gonna have our three speakers then, and then after the discussion, we'll actually uh, be in, um, hosting a book launch for two books. Um, and uh, you'll hear more about that at the end. But I do wanna remind everyone that there are two additional workshops coming up on the 18th of September about um, alternatives for large and small dams. Uh, in the Amazon and on the 2nd of October, thinking about just our gaps in understanding about decision making and management. So today we're going to talk about the tools, the status of adaptive management. What do we know about how information is used in decision making? How can we improve existing policies? Um, and how has science been used in this role? Um, and to help us with that, we have our three speakers, Dr. David Wagner, Julian Olden, and Osilio Moniz. I will introduce them each individually. And just to put your eyes on this schedule, after our three speakers, we will have a discussion open to everyone to participate. Afterwards, uh, we'll be hosting this book launch. So what I'd like to do now um, is just thank all of the participants and all of the uh, funders and all of the organizers for, for their efforts. And I'm going to introduce Dr. David Wagner while we get his presentation on the screen. Dr. David Wagner, he currently works on strategic planning and water resources nationally and internationally uh, with the National Academy of Sciences, Water Science and Technology Board. Uh, he formerly served in the U.S. House of Representatives on water management policies and legislation, and he has experience in <clears throat> engineering, aquatic ecology, um, climate change, and, and most relevant to us today, adaptive management and actually implementing large-scale projects to change the way water is managed and respond to stakeholders' um, needs, desires, and reactions. So, David, uh, with that, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. And, and thank you for the invitation to speak on this panel today. It's a great honor. Can we do? Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, I guess I'll start out by just saying for the last 40 years, I've been working on various parts of adaptive management. Um, from initially the design and the application of it to actually writing policy for it in Washington, D.C., and then looking at over 100 different applications of adaptive management to see what makes it work and, in many cases, what, why it doesn't work and why it's not successful. I track about these 100 adaptive management programs around the globe, and they, they evolve, and there are several key things that have evolved out of that study. And today, my structure of my talk is going to hit these four sections in the 14 or so minutes that I have remaining. Um, I want to do a short introduction here, want to start, and then talk about creating the environment and the culture for adaptive management. Section three, we'll talk about constructing adaptive management and then summarize it at the end. Um, adaptive management has been applied in many different, to many different issues and applications and problems, from river management to looking at species management, coastal ecosystems, dam management. Um, it's been applied to actually removing dams and looking at water quality issues. And lately, it's also been applied here in the United States in the context of agricultural activities in the Western United States related to demand side management and the changing dynamics related to climate change and water availability for agriculture. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about what I've found in the review of these adaptive management programs and what it takes to be successful. I say that um, with some hesitation because a lot of people believe that once you go to adaptive management, success is guaranteed. Unfortunately, what I've found is that in many cases, adaptive management has been implemented as a diversion or a, I don't want to call it a tactic, but I guess it is in many uh, text to avoid making the tough decisions. What adaptive management is, is a process. It's a process that will help us reduce risk and improve decisions in complex water and resource management decisions. And to be successful, you need kind of four big parts. You need collaboration between a group of willing stakeholders who want to solve the problem. You need science. 
you need authority and leadership to actually implement it. And then you need a governance plan to actually implement and get the work done. Success, and so in my review, success is in, in terms of creating the environment and culture for adaptive management, success is dependent on these four areas. One, defining the problem. Two, establishing the overall objective of why you're, you're, you're dealing with this issue. Then identifying and articulate project goals. And then addressing these tasks are necessary before deciding if an adaptive management program is necessary. And I say that because in several instances, adaptive management has been identified as the go-to method, but we find out that it really isn't necessary. It may just be that you need to do some additional research. It may be that you just need to implement some, a very definitive monitoring program, and you may not actually need adaptive management. So we have to put the process together to make sure we're using the right process. I've also found that assumptions can be very hazardous to the success of adaptive management. So what do we know about adaptive management? One, it is not about business as usual. It's changing the dynamic of how we make decisions. Adaptive, it's adaptive management. It's not adaptive science. So it's the management that we're, we're working to adapt to what the science is telling us. Thirdly, it's not a set of boxes to be checked. And in many cases around the, around the world, adaptive management has been implemented and administrators think, well, as long as we're checking the box, we're good. We can keep doing what we're doing and not make a change. That is not the intent of adaptive management. And then lastly, you need to understand your risk in order to design your, uh, the appropriate program. And I say that because risk comes in two forms. Risk comes in structural risk. And the example I will use for that is a farmer who's, who's trying to weigh, when do I plant? When do I harvest? All the way to um, managers who work to determine when they open a fishing season or a hunting season. Systemic risk is the risk that we don't often have good char characterization of. And climate change is a good example of a systemic risk that's now forcing all of us to look at issues in a much more uh, definitive manner. Next slide. How can adaptive management help then in risk management? Well, first off, it's multidisciplinary. Second, it combines research, monitoring, and predictive capa capacities. It integrates across both temporal and spatial scales. It is based on hypothesis testing as related to management actions. And it includes a form of structured decision making. And we'll go into this more in just a few minutes. But it is not business as usual. Next. There we go. Um, the, dynamic, the, the dynamic that changes with adaptive management, in my view, has to do with making sure you've got stakeholder engagement and identifying who the stakeholders are and when the stakeholders are, be, are to be involved is critically important to the process. And in my, in my review, engaging stakeholders early in the process helps you get to the decision points faster and more efficiently. So now let's talk a bit about the process of creating the environment for adaptive management. Traditional approaches to water management were driven by specific user groups who are interested primarily in development. In the United States, it's often water user groups or irrigation groups or um, power development groups who have driven the process. It has not been a collaborative stakeholder driven process. Secondly, time, legislative direction and policies, litigation and rising awareness of the public has increased awareness in the need for adaptive management. People, as they become educated on the process, see that there are ways that they can be engaged appropriately. Thirdly, adaptive management works most effect effectively where a group of stakeholders develops capacity or knowledge to create dialogue, share information, and work towards solutions. The goal is to create a culture of trust so that the power user and the farmer can sit across the table from the scientist and the fisherman to help resolve issues and understand the, what is needed to achieve the objectives and meet 
meet the expected um, expectations that the group may have. There are, there are six common stages of adaptive management, and you can read them on the slide there, so I don't want to take your time to, to go through that. But a lot of people want to jump immediately to the design, the science design, and the development and implementation. But what I've found, if you don't put the work in up front on stages, phases one and two, initiation and definition, the chances of success are diminished significantly. So section three, constructing this adaptive management process. What we need to look at, it makes no sense to jump to the science unless you have these tasks, three tasks completed first. One, you have to have established authority. What gives you the direction to actually implement adaptive management? Secondly, you have to have established governance. What are the rules of the road? What's the direction and policy to implement? Third is a commitment to stakeholders and collaboration. You can't create a stakeholder group or a collaborative group and then not include them in the process. It's just window dressing if you go that way and they figure it out real quick and adaptive management will not work. Next slide. So designing this second phase, the design and development of adaptive management has four kind of explicit, explicit issues. One, you have to define or set the objectives of both the stakeholders and the managers. They have to sit down together and collectively determine what is your objective. Then that same group has to identify the goals, the requirements, and what are our expert expectations. Is it full recovery of an ecosystem or a species? Is it maintaining power demands? You know, you have to set what your expectations are. Then you need to create and implement the policy to engage the program. How is it going to be run both on a financial basis and on an administrative basis? And lastly, you've got to implement that governance so that everybody knows how this process will work. So using science and structured decision making is important. But it's also important there are many different types of science that will be brought to the process. On the left side of the screen, that's a group of citizen scientists who are collecting information in the California uh, San Francisco Bay Delta ecosystem. You also will be doing experiments and, uh, and laboratory work. You'll have definitive agency data that is being brought to the table. And importantly, you will also have academic institutions who will be engaged in bringing information that's critical to the discussion. So I'm not gonna go into, into the design of a science program. You folks are all experts in that, and you know that process. But what I do wanna talk about is how science is used. Structured decision-making or how you use the science is critically important to the process. Quality decisions require the right science, the right analysis, and the right decision process. Structured decision-making is based on process that includes known management objectives, decision options, and the predictions of decision outcomes. Decision, structured decision-making is a process that uses the best science available to provide stakeholders and decision makers with the information and analysis that can be translated into improved knowledge and decision quality. So, the, oh, oh, we went one too many. That's all right, we can just, we'll just do this. Well, oh, there you go. So the elements that are necessary, support for science, you need to have science leadership and action. You need to frame the science around the ecosystem needs and processes. You have to map those ecosystem drivers and process. You have to determine the level of science required, the expectations and knowledge, and identify the level of risk that's acceptable to the managers and decision makers. So what we're trying to do is create the architecture of understanding. And that includes identifying the context of the problem, the system responses, and the types of risks that you will be exposed to. Next slide. So in summary, there are these seven points. Uno, adaptive management is a process. Dos, adaptive management is commitment. Trace, you need to identify and understand risk. Quattro, science is the credibility for decisions. Seis is we have to create a strategy with flexibility. Um, Seis, uh, we need to make quality decisions. 
and Siete, we need to do the work up front that's necessary for success. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, David, so much. And thank you for uh, um, being flexible as we're learning to get Zoom all correct and having your slides shared from Brazil all the way to you and back to everyone in the world. Thank you. Excellent. And you are under time, so hats off to you. Thank you so much. So we'll transition now to our second panelist. So um, Julian, you can go ahead and share your, your screen. Dr. Julian Olden is a professor in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Science at the University of Washington. His research program spans multiple levels of biological organization and modes of inquiry to advance the science and practice of conserving freshwater ecosystems. So you've all seen uh, Dr. Olden's papers on uh, fish and fish migrations and fish communities and the impacts of dams. And um, we hopefully will learn today a little bit about how to, you know, coexist with dams and fisheries populations. Or maybe you'll tell us it's not possible, but we're excited to hear that. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, David. Thank you all for this uh, opportunity. Thank you, Carol, Stephanie, and all the organizing committee for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, as a side note, I'm just really excited about this network and the opportunity to be involved. Um, with just a little bit of my research in Brazil, I've always found it fascinating to kind of increase international collaborations as we all learn together how best we can kind of protect rivers in the future while supporting human societal growth. So it's, I'm just, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think we'd all agree that food, water, and energy security are the cornerstones for a sustainable and prosperous future. And rivers play a really large role in delivering critical ecosystem services that contribute to this security. Uh, but decisions on how rivers harnessed or harnessed or otherwise used or controlled for the benefits of human societies really often results in environmental and social conflicts, and we're kind of forced to try to navigate some of these conflicts. The work I'm gonna be talking about today is really an, an exciting collaboration between three uh, uh, graduate students that were in my lab. To the left is uh, Chiago Kotu, who's a PhD student in my lab, Matisse Messenger, who's a master's student, and Will Chen to the right, who's a master's student. Uh, some of the most wonderful things that I do is work with uh, graduate students and, and the work that we do, and the stuff I'm gonna be reporting is in large part because of the incredible efforts of these three individuals. This is a question that um, often I pose to myself, and I'm sure all of you think about this before uh, putting your head on to bed at night. How do we begin to even try to balance this um, trade-offs, if you will, between energy production and conservation when we think about hydro power development? And in particular, this is a mounting challenge as not only do we have a lot of hydropower now, but it's projected to increase in the coming decades to meet increasing population demands. And unregulated or free-flowing rivers, we would all agree, provide um, um, many ecosystem services. But as you can see, through time, there's been kind of a real transition in the way in which we try to harness uh, uh, our river systems, shown here in the bottom plot. And we've seen real kind of three main errors or periods of study, if you will, or the way in which we uh, tried to manage river systems through time. Um, in the early 40s and 50s, it was really an engineering era where water resource development was uh, dominated for societal use. Um, more recently, um, in the 1980s, there's been kind of this change in paradigm a little bit where we start to think about uh, kind of the conservation of river systems, particularly with setting minimum in-stream flows and simple physical habitat models. Uh, then there's, we've kind of emerged into what we call the ecological era, where we try to think about entire regimes and more holistic approaches to try to understand these river systems. And like many of you, I often ponder what this means, so what this might look like in the future. Um, and um, and this is us entering this kind of what we call a social ecological era, where we start to think about how can we integrate multiple values and trade-offs and optimally allocate water or the design of new hydropower. So as ecologists, let's be, let's be honest with one another. Um, as ecologists, we've done a very good job in uh, vocally communicating the value of rivers, the value of free flowing rivers for human societies, for the goods and services provided by them. But then also let's be honest with, what, with all of each other and say that we've really failed. We failed in providing the currency to try to describe these ecological processes in a way in which we can actually trade off ecological values from economic gains. And this is something that I think is a really exciting frontier in, in kind of research and collaborative research right now is thinking about 
how we can develop more formal approaches to assess these trade-offs. Um, one really significant advantage or gain of in analytical capabilities recently has been the use of multi-objective optimization. This is how do we balance or look at trade-offs between multiple objectives, knowing that a gain in one objective often comes in a loss of another. And today I wanna to talk a little bit about just the use of uh, some work that we've been using multi-objective optimization in two ways. One, to think about how we can design more ecologically sustainable dam operations, that is flow releases for existing dams. And then pivoting to the future, how can we use this to systematically plan for new dam construction? Now, let's be, I'm gonna be honest here, this is not an answer to um, navigating these really complex trade-offs or conversations that we have when we think about hydropower dam, but it's just one of many tools that I think is pretty fruitful as ecologists can better engage the conversation um, uh, when really uh, assessing what these trade-offs look like, both for current dam management and into the future. Well, multi-objective optimization has been really um, shown some really nice advantages and recently in thinking about how we design environmental flows below dams. That is, how do we uh, reoperate dams in ecological sustainable ways? So John Sabo and others had some nice work in the Mekong where they're looking at how optimization can support water security, energy, and fisheries need. Some work in South Africa has been looking at how irrigation demands can meet, be met downstream while at the same time protect, protecting floodplains. And then finally, some work that we've been doing in the Colorado River Basin has been thinking about how do we make these trade-offs between allocating water for human use, but then also preserving native fish species in many of the kind of highly endangered river systems of the Colorado River Basin. So although this is not in the Amazon, and apologies for that, uh, for a second, I'm gonna bring us uh, to the Colorado River Basin. Although very different systems, um, they have the shared, um, um, shared notion that the fact that there's strong conflicts between water uses for humans versus in-stream uses. And these, a, lot, a lot of the lessons I believe that we see in the Colorado system are um, somewhat applicable to the Amazon and vice versa, as we learned from the Amazon, I think is very much applicable to the Colorado. So just for a second, I wanna bring you to the San Juan River. Um, this is a major tributary of the Colorado River here. I'm just highlighting here in this box. It's a very large dam, pr uh, predominantly for controlling water resources, moving uh, kind of downstream from the right to the left into Lake Powell and the main stem of the Colorado River. Uh, that's the Glen Canyon Dam produces Lake Powell, you've probably heard of. Um, this river, like all rivers in the Colorado River Basin, are, is highly over allocated. <clears throat> and for that reason, water is often a precious resource when we think about how it's managed across this complex of dams. We were interested in this very simple question, can we supply river water downstream from this Navajo reservoir in a way in which met irrigation water needs and human storage needs, but at the same time would actually promote native species persistence. These are in, uh, uh, um, endangered species in the river basin. And the last optimization was actually prohibit non-native species. Right, so this idea is that can we kind of balance off flows which would promote natives prohibit non-native species while all at the same time providing human water needs. Sounds like a pipe dream to me. Um, and traditionally we would call these conflicts or you can't have all at the same time. And I'm gonna show you how multi-optimization provides a way in which all three of these objectives might be able to be met. So our questions were, can dam operations below this dam be optimized to maintain human water needs while simultaneously benefiting native species and not non-native? And then importantly, during periods of drought or water scarcity, does this reduce our ability to actually successfully um, achieve these optimal outcomes? This is a quick slide, um, which just talks a little bit about kind of the objectives that we are trying to optimize. Let's go ahead and ignore them. I often do when I see mathematical equations. Um, so really on the top is just a, a series of different dams. Uh, evaporation occurs out of these dams. Water is then delivered downstream. Um, and what we wanna do is how do we deliver daily discharges below this dam, which maximizes native species abundance, minimizes non-native species abundance, and then it minimizes the deficit or the difference between water diversions and demands. That is, we want to basically have no deficit. We wanna always meet human needs. Now, the way in which we do this, um, and when we're confronted with multiple likely conflicting objectives, it's really impossible to create one single dam release, which is gonna meet all of these objectives perfectly. 
So our goal was actually to find a set of efficient flow designs. Um, that's, and what we call that is a Pareto frontier, um, which adheres to or best trades off these different um, ob objectives. So on this plot right here, each point is actually a multi-year flow regime, daily flow regimes, it's a hydrograph. And each one of those dots basically has three attributes related to it. The color of the dot is the water def uh, deficit proportion. If it is totally blue, that means we meet all human needs on a daily basis downstream. And as it becomes more red, it means we go into deficit. We're no longer meeting human needs. On the x-axis is native fish abundance, the gains in native fish abundances. We hope to be on the right side of this graph, right? We want to have a positive native species abundance. And on the y-axis is non-native species abundance. We hope to be low down, negative. We want to negatively affect them. And what we see on that Pareto frontier right there is a number of different solutions, if you will, which provide some return on native species abundance and non-natives. And often we'll explore along this frontier knowing that any uh, operation which is going to serve to increase native species abundance that moves from left to right necessarily also increases non-native species abundance. So there's our trade-offs that we're interested in looking at. What we can do is we can take one of those optimal, if you will, uh, flow release schedules. And this is what I'm showing right here on, on the right. This is a hydrograph just showing for one year of what the flow looks like blue currently in an unregulated, uh, unregulated tributary going in. And the light blue is what we're gonna be adding or the flow prescription, if you will, which is coming below the dam. And what we can see is that, and then on the bottom plot right here, this shows what the relation is or how benefit it is to native species in the upper plot and non-native species below the plot. So we can highlight a couple really interesting things. By providing flows right here in the late spring, which I'm highlighting here, we have a blue or a negative contribution in native species occurrence and we have a negative or a detrimental effect on non-native species occurrence. So that's a, a period of time in which um, a flow prescription is gonna be very beneficial. We also see that monsoon flooding is really important, particularly because it negatively affects non-native species and has a slight positive effect on natives. So we can identify kind of parts of the, hydro, um, um, the hydrograph um, which are most beneficial um, to uh, native and non-native species. Oh, you're good. Um, we see that overall native species have a very strong benefit to these uh, flow prescriptions, whereas non-native species have a very negative benefit. And in all cases, we're meeting human water needs. Second example I want to show you is that what is future dams. How can multiple optimization in terms of future dams be um, used? And multi-objective optimization has been some been really great examples. Rafael Almeida and others had a real, who's on the call, had a really nice paper looking at how it can identify portfolios which minimize carbon intensity as we think about developing new dams. Some examples of kind of uh, sand um, connectivity and contributions in new dams in the Mekong. And today I wanna to highlight just a, a little bit of some work that Chiago Kotu and I have been doing in terms of in the Amazon River Basin. Now I'm keenly aware that Chiago gave a most riveting talk um, earlier on this in which he highlighted some of the work that we've been looking at in terms of the increased uh, uh, amount of small hydropower and the fact that both large and small hydropower are like to show very large decreases in terms of river connectivity, that is increased fragmentation across the Brazilian portion of the Amazon River. But today I just wanna highlight uh, the optimization approach that we did. And we did this in large part because of this relationship. If we plot generation capacity of each planned or existing uh, planned dam um, in the Amazon, as a function of how much it changes fragmentation, we see hardly any relationship. And this is actually quite rewarding. The simple fact that, jam, that dam capacity in terms of megawatt production does not predict its uh, ecological effects on, on fragmentation. And we can leverage this by um, showing this plot right here. This plot right here basically shows um, the projections or the optimizations, if you will, of different portfolios of dams across the Amazon. We looked at about 4 million of them and identified the most optimal and the least optimal with respect to gaining generation capacity on the x-axis while trying to minimize the effect on river conductivity. In this case, we're interested in looking at this window right here, which is basically the projected energy demands of Brazil moving forward 
And in particular, we're interested in this upper curve right here, right? We want to gain this energy capacity, but we want to do, and to do so in which we preserve uh, connectivity for migratory fish species across the basin. And my simple point here, and just wrapping up, I want to say is that we, by doing this, we identified a couple hundred different options, if you will, of optimal dam combinations, which produce the same total national capacity than, um, than a bunch of least optimal ones, which involved about twice the number of dams. So although there's many other decisions that go in in terms of siting dams, and I'm not, I don't want to kind of gloss over those, this shows that there's considerable scope with respect to producing same energy capacity, but doing so in a way um, that does, doesn't overly compromise or does a better job of minimizing the effects on river connectivity. So quickly moving forward, when I look at a big dam like this, I'm often daunted by the challenges that we have moving forward, but I attempt to be an optimist and I look at the rainbow and think about whether or not we can actually, there's a smarter way forward with respect to hydropower. And I just wanna highlight three simple facts here. I believe that better outcomes for hydropower development are possible given that hydropower is part of our future. And these outcomes can be done in a way that avoid the most damaging locations and direct development towards sites that have lower overall ecological impact. And I'm giving you an example of that in the Amazon River. I believe that we can minimize impacts and restore key processes through better design and operation of individual dams. And I would argue that dynamic optimization really contributes to these first two points. And then finally, as a group, as a community, we need to think a little bit about how do we offset in those cases where those impacts cannot be avoided and in some ways, they might be difficult decisions where we think about investing in compensation, that is the protection of nearby rivers that provide similar values, but are basically a shut off from development. Um, with that, I just want to thank a number of folks and this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julian. Um, that was great. I think, you know, your, your talk flowed great from uh, David Wagner. So we have this process and now you showed us a really clear example of some tools to be used in, in that sort of decision-making process. Um, and now we're fortunate enough to have um, our third speaker, Mr. Ocelia Muniz, who currently contributes to the coordination of the Movement of Dam Affected Peoples, known by MABE in, in Portuguese, uh, from the state of Hondonia. Um, and he's part of the Political Formation Collective and the LGBT Collective of the National MABE Organization. And today he's going to be talking to us about uh, um, adaptive management in uh, being applied actually in communities and in and social and um, human movements um, to protect sort of community rights and um, autonomy. Fantastic. I am Ocelio Muniz. I am a member of the national government or uh, movement for the dams in the state of Rondonia that is called MAVE. I live in Porto Velho, que, that is the capital city. And our contribution to this important aspect about this topic, MAVE will bring the experience we have in terms of the social movement that uh, strikes to defend the implementation of hydroelectrical dams in Rondonia, respecting the right of the, the individuals. Let me know if I'm talking too fast, please. I just uh, prepared this presentation to share a little bit with you about the, the issue of connection. Uh, but I wanted to share with you some of, the, some of the milestones of our fight in terms of what happened in the state of Rondonia. It was uh, it started in the military dictatorship that we had once they decided to start huge dams around the country, trying to defend the impacted populations due to the construction of these dams. It was uh, an objective to, to to 
to move that hydroelectrical model to to hydroelectrical power, uh, but respecting the rights of the population. Since the military dictatorship up to now in our country, many standards were established in relation to the construction of these uh, dams because they, many of them unfortunately uh, built their works without respecting the rights of the populations and that's uh, the, the pattern of their operations. That's a violation of fundamental rights in many, level, in many levels. It starts with the right of information and participating in the design of the hydroelectrical dam, the right of freedom of gathering, association and expression, the right of work and a respectful life, the right to, to have the right of a proper household, and uh, these are the right violations that were identified by the Council of Human Rights. And when we talk about adaptivist actions in terms of the construction of these dams, it was a historical process in Brazil that showed that during this process, unfortunately, communities or the popular participation were not part of the decision-making process. It was an imposition due to this historical military dictatorship that uh, violated many uh, freedoms, including as well the right to uh, proper education, right of a uh, healthy environment and health, to protect our family, to, to have this uh, retribution in case of violation of this right. This was a process of a study during the construction of hydroelectrical dams. Here in Rondonia, we have two hydroelectrical dams Santo Antonio y Girau that are located in the Madera River that came from the north of Bolivia here in the region of the Amazonia. And we work with many other institutions, NGOs, because After building these uh, hydroelectrical centrals, many others will be will have open uh, access to build similar dams without the process of the consultation and two consortiums were involved in the construction of this uh, hydroelectrical dam. One of them was the Consortium Energia Sustentable do Brasil with the acronym of UHE Girau. And the other consortium was called Madeira Energia, que was a private consortium led by Odebrecht. In this presentation, I wanted to share with you that the, the previous evaluation with the communities that are called the public hearing These, uh, unfortunately, are imposed. Here we have a couple of pictures that illustrate this issue. On the left side, we have Ladeira with public hearings that put in one part the people and in another part the company stakeholders. So there is no any single time where a community leader will be consulted or be part of the debate. So this picture brings a huge conflict we experience here in Rondonia. 
because many of these public hearings are unfortunately not taking into account the people's voice. Another, the second picture was uh, also a, another hydroelectrical central of Hidromonte that has a group of police officers that were blocking the entrance for the people, so that were not in favor of the construction of that hydroelectrical plant. And unfortunately, for due to economical interests and uh, political interests, uh, they have this conflict because of the interest they had to build the uh, the dam without any single adaptive management to go for the public interest. And when the Santo Antonio dam was constructed, unfortunately, there were many, many events that were quite outrageous. Many of the houses around the project were burned or to intimidate the populations around the project. And that's something, for, for instance, this one, these pictures come from the violence that is still we have today around dam project, this case of the Santo Antonio Dam. Of course, at the start of the construction of the hydroelectrical dams, we have huge floods around the sites that will have certainly an, not only an environmental impact, but also an impact in the populations. Unfortunately, even though they had this environmental plan before the, the the construction was started, they undermined or underestimate the impact of these uh, floodings. This is a picture that was taken in 2015 comparing with 2011 that show the dimension of this, this uh, lagoon. Do you see this red dot? That is an area completely covered by forest. And the second image in 2015, after the construction, you see how the lagoon was completely extended due to the floating process after the construction of this dam. So this is a tangible impact without Unfortunately, without proper information that unfortunately the hydroelectric the hydro, hydroelectrical dam underestimate the impact of its construction. And next slide, we have another, another example of floats that were outside the area of impact of the hydroelectrical dam. those areas were not uh, unfortunately they did not conducted the the cleaning of the of the area before and this completely floated with a huge loss of these communities, riverside communities, and also wildlife. Together with the, when we talk about impact and the history of the construction of dams in Brazil, the government created a pol uh, hydro energetic policy to guarantee the construction of these dams for hydroelectrical means 
And unfortunately, this was not taken into account the population that could be impacted due to the construction of these dams. This was a national policy that was part of the interest of the companies and leaving behind the interest of the communities affected. This is a, uh, the, the marketing strategy of the hydroelectrical companies to give the give the uh, better quality of life for the riverside communities. But unfortunately, unfortunately, many of them, due to the unrespected commitments, they have to move away to other sites. So the policy of rights that were proposed in the Brazilian reality today, even though they constructed these uh, houses, but um, were improperly built, and that's how they they ended up moving away. Unfortunately, the the legal framework has many decrees that guarantees the construction of the hydroelectrical dams, but on the other side, we don't have a legal framework that will guarantee the respect of the rights of the communities around the construction of these dams. There's no a public policy, and that's something that I forget to put in the slides, but But, uh, but unfortunately, there wasn't a proper baseline study to measure the impact. And today, unfortunately, we don't have an, a governmental entity that will guarantee the respect of the rights of the impacted families. And there is no financial uh, program to defend or to retribute the expenses or the damage made by the hydroelectrical dam construction. You see the many damages that we have, they don't have, they don't have a standard to build the houses for these uh, impacted communities. Unfortunately, there's no policy of repair or a program to follow up the impacts of these uh, constructions. So we will need a legal framework and a governmental entity that will warranty the respect of the communities and the environment. Unfortunately, there is no right, or there is no legal framework or strategy that will guarantee the, the, that will defend the position of the communities over the uh, position of the companies that will build these dams. And they are unfortunately exposed to the private sector of Brazil and I hope that based on this uh, debate, we can promote a public policy that will defend not only the communities impacted, but also the fishers that are extremely impacted by the hydroelectric dams. These policies are only agreements within the consortiums only these public, private companies are the ones who decided how to do and where to build, and they do not take into account what are the impacts in the small farmers or uh, agricultures and the fishers. And just to conclude, I wanted to thank the invitation uh, for this important debate saying that the world of dams are unfortunately quite conflicting right now in the Brazilian scenario due to the lack of 
uh, a legal framework and, and popular participation led by women, men, public universities, making that an alternative public policy is there to guarantee the rights of the impacted population. And that's something that we'll accomplish fighting and with the promotion of uh, the proper legislation behind this uh, problematic. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you so much, Ocilio, and to all of our presenters. Excellent, really great. I think listening to these three presenters gives us a, a kind of a trajectory of thought where Dr. Wagner told us about, you know, what it takes to make an adaptive management program and described it there's a lot of steps, but really what it is, is an architecture of understanding, um, which I thought was a great way to, to frame it. Um, and Julian told us about um, going into this new era, the era of social ecological management and thinking about how to manage multiple functions. Um, and we looked in your case, Julian, of, of fish and of greenhouse gases. And as we move to Ocilia, Ocilio's description of human communities and um, unfortunately, we heard the story of conflict instead of dialogue. We heard um, really very few of, of Dave Wagner's suggestions for building an adaptive management program as being present. And so the impacts are being felt in many ways across sectors um, and beyond sort of predicted areas of impact. And Ocilio, thank you for pointing to us to the idea of a lacking legal framework and public policy to really rely on um, which David told us about in the beginning is needed in order to achieve this. So with um, sort of that's a, just a sort of way to encapsulate the three talks that we heard. And I'm going to thank you very much all the presenters. And if you all go down to your reactions and give a nice round of applause for all of our speakers. Um, we are not done yet for today. We actually have the great pleasure of um, launching two ebooks with uh, our wonderful colleagues, Carol Doria and Elena G. Marcus. Elena G, if you are there and if your internet is stable, I'd ask you to come online now, please. Yes, here I am. Olá, boa tarde a todos. So I would like to take this opportunity to present after a very long work. We are finishing this product of the workshop that was conducted in Palmas in 2008. 18, as you know, we are in the process, a process of the adaptive change or adaptive management, including the different phases we are experiencing in Brazil. And we call this publication Rivers, Land and Cultures. Today we are bringing this pre-launching. I hope that we could have available this book in a couple of weeks, in a couple of weeks in the side of the group. So we are trying to understand many systems such as the system in the Tocantins River, bringing inter and transdisciplinary strategies that many participants of the workshop bring to us in the Amazon rainforest up to 2019. This uh, learning from the Tocantins socioeconomical system is going to be presented in different markets, led by Juliana Lacer. That was a wonderful work. Thank you so much. The objective of the workshop was to create a dialogue between the social stakeholders along the implementation of dance in the social environmental social environmental socio-ecological system from the Tocantins River. This event included 160 participants in the construction of the book as authors, in, including 55 institutions. Happened with a lot of things going on in the same time, giving a great experience 
for all those who were involved in the project. So we have representatives from social movements, public entities, representatives from governmental institutions, from the public ministry, the secretary of education, the secretary of education, youth and sports infrastructure, representatives from local communities, and also the academia, people from universities, members of the communities of Tocantins, communities from Piracema, and many students from undergraduation, postgraduation, researchers from Brazilian entities and also from abroad, mainly from the US. So this is a multidisciplinary book with some parts written in English, other in Portuguese. This is still a, a great challenge to share this kind of information in the academic world. Even though it looks easy, it's not easy at all. This is the, con the content of the book with six uh, titles, highlighting that we are the organizers. We have Juliana Laufer, myself, Simonia Taigi, Diana Daisy, that was part of the federal government of Tocantins. It was a work with many people working together. The book is organized in six sections. In interaction between social actors, transdisciplinary learning, talking to the specialists that were, were bring to the workshop with shared knowledge that were events that happened during the, the workshop. In the last one is an exercise of bringing products that are developed by the results of the work by the network in a more accessible language. What we have in the section one, interaction between social actors. We, we have included the perspective from many authors in the process of planning, licensing, Monitor, monitoring of hydroelectrical dams, both in Brazil and in the US. This is a very interesting group where we were able to interchange ideas with very productive messages. So we have these important aspects in the area of the Tocantin River with a very nice experience. Bringing perspective from authors that were part of the process here in Tocantins River. So here we included governmental and non-governmental bodies. Second chapter or second section is the interaction between social actors, especially from tribes of, uh, around the Colorado River. So it brings a debate between the social actors and public policies and the challenges that bring from the social environmental areas of the Amazon rainforest. We have many uh, interesting, interesting debates on policy makers. And this is an analysis of the participation of the network of social stakeholders. This chapter compile different experiences that we had with other events from the international network of dams, how we were able to build this process. 
uh, what is the direction we are driving towards to. In this section, we included some transdisciplinary learning experiences with two of them that were reported in the field visits. One of them is learning with other or learning with each other with the community of fishers in a group of children in the Tocantins River uh, Basin. And it is about an interchange of indigenous communities in Colorado River and the Andean uh, or the indigenous communities. Indigenous communities around the Tocantins River. It was a quite, quite interesting cultural exchange of the legacy of the hydroelectrical dams and how does these uh, dams impact the communities around the Tocantins Rivers and the Colorado River. The next chapter, we have this transdisciplinary learning, rivers, values, and uses for the decision making. How these people perceive the value of rivers and how this could be taken into context for the research and decision-making process. This section, talking with the specialist, in this workshop we had four specialists. And here we have a summary of the presentation that we had on the event. So two of these specialists present strategies for the social, environmental, and energetic development in the Amazon rainforest, performed by Evergracio, that works in the University of Tocantins. And here we have another, the other talk from Emilio Moran, the Forgetting People in Energy Development of Belo Monte and other dams having this uh, uh, complemented by the climate change impacts on Native American res water resources, a chapter that talked about the solutions that were presented on the, based on the reflection on Carleta Chief, uh, based on the, her experience working with the, the indigenous communities. The next uh, aspect was damming and changes, fish and fisheries, talking about the uh, dams of Brazil, and also a debate bring by Angelo Antonio Agostinho from the University Estadual of Maringá. The constitution of the book brings the, res the summaries of all those who participated of the event with us. It's a research project or a research process that is based on 61 contributions. So within this section of expanded summaries or ex expanded abstracts, we have social and cultural and biological impact on biodiversity governance, social stakeholders and public policies with 14 papers, fishing, fish and fisheries activities with five papers, hydrology and geomorphology with four papers, climate change with one paper and cross-cutting themes with five church chapter and uh, finally the communication of uh, the summaries. This workshop finished with a experimental fair presenting these uh, research experiences with posters, presentations 
a cultural uh, fair with dancing, music, and also a musical number. Con Felipe singing with together with a Arizona colleague with a very interesting experience that was related to this interrelation that we had that goes beyond the academic uh, work together. In section six that was popularizing science, bring papers that were already published that were transformed, transformed into a more popular language. This entire section had five contributions. The first one is a mapping about hydraulic energy and sustainability of the Brazilian Amazon rainforest, current progresses and future possibilities. The second talks about talks about the fragmentation of connectivity of the Andean regions and the Amazon rainforest due to hydroelectrical dams. The next one talks about the visibility, the invisibility of fish within the process of development of hydroelectrical energy in the Amazon rainforest that was presented to as many students of post-graduation that comes together with some of the things that were presented on the debate of today. For the reduction of the fish and uh, increasing prices, the economical cost of the tropical rivers, construction of dams, and this is a case study performed in the Madeira River. And closing this section, we had uh, uh, an analysis of big hydroelectrical centers to time to abandon the traditional model. And this is how we wanted to share with you uh, this uh, book. We will, we would like to thank you all for your participation. Without any doubt, this is a huge effort. And the idea was to put together many topics related to the topic and was quite a big challenge. And we would like to thank all who, all who, those who participated, both in the construction of the book, the editor, the reviewers, authors, and all of those who were involved in the con in the constitution of the book, not only the authors, but also the universities and the entities that were part of this publication. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Elineide. We are very happy to have this product ready. Without any doubt, it will be a very, very useful source of information and also for the implant, implantation of the process of hydroelectrical dams in the Amazon rainforest. And we would like also to announce the results of this card of data that was created by the group of professors that were members of the project of hydroelectrics for the Amazon rainforest that was financed by the CAPS. This project started in 2018, but we just finished the, these the cards. Together with professors of the University of Rondonia, Federal of Tocantins, Pará, Amazon, and also with cooperation with the University of Florida and students that were involved in the conduct, in their uh, in the PhD or master degree studies. And this is a very a result of a big effort to synthesize a small uh, booklet that could be used 
to con to build any document that will be useful about the impact of hydroelectrical dams uh, for high school students. So that's why we created, we summarized version in comparison with all the content that was debated during the ebook or the workshop. And I would like to share with you a little bit about the content of this booklet. We talk a little bit about the species, uh, bio the, the impact and the importance of biodiversity in, in, to understand the impact of the hydroelectrical dams. We present some data on the features of the communities, especially in the basins that were researched in the that the researchers that were involved in the Tocantins basins, the riverside communities, and the users of this fish resource to talk about the environmental impact. If we quote some examples, even though quoted in some papers, and the main impacts that were that could suffer this resource when uh, when a dam is built. And we also have this process of intervention along a historical series of the number of hydroelectrical plants that were built as an alternative of energy for the Brazilian government. And we have, of course, a little more uh, information we will use this, that opportunity with uh, different sources of to consult. For those students that would like to investigate, to know a little bit more about the results or the research, they could get into these sites. And that being said, I would like to introduce the entire group because we have this wonderful work with the network of Amazon uh, dams. Uh, the main objective of this booklet was to share the results. So especially for those young ones to know a little bit more about what is going on in our country, especially with the affected communities and to be informed about what is going on, what is happening with the Amazon uh, rivers. So giving information for future generations so they could participate in a more informed manner for this debate in this debate. And with that, I would like to, to thank you all for your attention. I will lead the word again to David using this opportunity to present this couple of results. And after this, this the material will be available in the network page. So you can make any consultation you would like to do with these uh, products. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Ellen Agee, and congratulations to you and to the network for producing um, these great products. I wanted to remind everyone that this is only the third panel of our five panel uh, workshop session. So we will have uh, our next one on uh, 18th of September. Uh, it's 2 p.m. in Florida. It's 13, no, 1,500 hours in Brasilia, 1,400 hours in La Paz. Um, talking about alternatives for small and large dams in the Amazon. <clears throat> we have excellent speakers lined up. Um, and next week, we also have a, like a video room that will be uh, launched after the, the speakers and the panel with short videos from, um, I think from local community groups and social actors uh, and even a filmmaker or two. So that'll be a treat to um, come together uh, in two weeks um, and see each other again. And of course, our last panel on the 2nd of October. I wanna thank everyone again for their participation um, and for calling in today and for learning together with us and for asking excellent questions. To David Wagner, Julian Olden, and Ocelio Muniz, thank you so much for your time and effort and your commitment and uh, in investing time with us to, to teach us all uh, about this complicated uh, process and we hope that we can all improve the management of these social and ecological systems by learning together with you. So until then, um, thank you very much. Have a great afternoon and we will see you in two weeks. Ciao.